Right, so let's have a look at, uh, at an analysis of health and social care in, in London. So we're going to be using an open source data source uh, to be able to analyse the different demographics of health and social care uh, around London. Okay, London has one of the, the, the best open source data source really probably in, in, in the world. And this site here contains a great deal of uh, open source data sets that can be used fairly easily and then cross-correlated. It also has a nice uh, real-time uh, display of key metrics, as you can see here, total workforce jobs, uh, recycling and so on. And these are very useful for citizens in London, people who do business there, and even people coming to live in the city can understand uh, the basic demographics of it. Okay, so this is the the site here, and it has a great deal of data there, uh, and the city really tries to understand the different demographics that that it has. So you find that there are many Excel spreadsheets, CSV files, and so on, and we can look at the London in terms of uh, the region and wards and boroughs and and so on. And the great thing about uh, the, the London data infrastructure is that they want to be world leading in terms of their data infrastructure. As you can see here, they want to create a dynamic and productive city environment. Uh, and they want to reduce the friction in sharing data and to provide value added uh, uh, exploitation of it, but to also use it as a driver for businesses uh, and to have some uh, significant impact on, uh, on 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 the usage of data. Then we see a really push, a great push forward uh, with with the data infrastructure around data sharing across uh, London. Okay, so so let's look at London as a city, and we'll find really it varies greatly as we move between the different boroughs and wards. First, if we look at uh, the uh, the kids who leave school at 16 or under and we plot that against those who leave greater than 24 typically staying on for MSc, PhD and so on we actually see a demographic where we have uh, the more deprived areas have a high, relatively high uh, leaving age for 16 or under uh, to, the, to the less deprived areas or the affluent areas uh, where uh, there is generally an, an older time that uh, that kids leave leave school. Okay, so here we have Kensington and, and Hammersmith, Richmond, and so on, and it goes all the way down to Havering there, Bexley, Barking, Enfield, and so on. Okay, so generally what we're seeing is the spectrum of affluence as it goes through the, the city. And then if we look at something like uh, fruit and veg uh, consumption, so along this way, so this is uh, the fewest consumption of five foot and vegetables a day and this is the most over here. And then we look at the healthy weight uh, of kids as they enter primary school probably about four or five years old in, in London. And again we see this uh, this this trend where there's a correlation almost between strong correlation between uh, healthy eating and healthy weight kids. Again we see uh, the, the more deprived areas having the the weakest uh, uh, profile up to the more affluent areas. So let's have a look at that in terms of our chart. Okay, so here we go. There's Barking, Havering, Bexley, Tower Hamlets, Greenwich and Newham. And then up here we have Richmond upon Thames, Kingston upon Thames, Westminster and Kensington and Chelsea. Okay, so we generally see uh, more deprived and least deprived up the top here 
And this is a general pattern that we'll see across London. So here is the here is the the different uh, boroughs with inside London. These are the most deprived uh, areas, and we move into really affluent areas around here. And this shows here uh, the free primary school meals here, and then the free secondary school meals there. And we actually see that uh, there's almost a direct correlation between uh, those receiving free primary school meals and then secondary school meals. So it almost shows that, that once you're, once an area uh, has defined its, its free school meals at primary, it's almost going to be the same when we go to uh, secondary. If we look at this plot, then perhaps we can understand the different uh, demographics. So at the top, what we see is Tower Hamlets, and then right down here we see Richmond and Kensington upon Thames. What we see here is a profile that means that uh, Newham, Haringey, and Southwark have actually increased the number of kids getting uh, free school meals at secondary because they go above the average here. Where in this case in Kensington, Westminster, Hammersmith, Barnet, we can actually see we've dropped from 16.7 to 13.1 uh, when it gets to secondary. So there is a redu reduction where the ones above the bar are actually increasing the requirement for free school meals when we move to secondary. Okay, now if we plot uh, underweight and overweight kids at uh, the first time that they enter primary school, we see that generally in the more affluent areas, uh, we see kids are generally more underweight and in the least affluent areas they tend to be more overweight. There are areas here which are which we would define as outliers and sometimes it's the outliers that are the most interesting because they buck the trend in some way. They're either improving things or not doing so well. Okay, so here is Harrow, Brent, Redridge uh, down here that have more underweight kids and up here we see uh, kids who are generally uh, more overweight from there. Okay, so for some reason we have uh, Sutton does well here and Kingston upon Thames and Red Bridge. And if we take uh, the obese uh, children at reception, that's the primary one, age four and five, and then on to year six, which is about 10 or 11 years old, we actually see there's almost a direct correlation between the kids going in uh, who are obese at, at the first stage of primary, and then this, the uh, correlation and increase when they get to year six, age 10 or 11. And this is actually a 50%, 51% increase in kids who enter with uh, school within four or five years, they are, they are obese. So we have an increase in, uh, in levels here. So if we look at this, and it's, you can see a very strong correlation there Okay, so we can see that uh, Newham, we went from 13.4% obese to 27.4. Here, 8.2 to 20.7, and so on. This is the least obese area, but it's still increasing uh, between the reception and year six. This one here is generally increasing greatly. Uh, and it's almost trebling the, the number between primary and uh, year six.
Okay, so if we look at an opposite trend, so this is in terms of uh, our obesity levels, and now we're looking at healthy levels. So for healthy levels, we want to see how that changes. So we see here the c kids are coming in uh, with uh, with with levels in this case of 79% healthy weight, but by the time they get to year six, it's down to 67.8. Okay, so so we actually see a reduction in the healthy weights, and as we've seen, we see an increase in in obesity levels uh, between those 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 years of the school. And London has data on, on the different wards so that we can really drill down because in London you'll find even from street to street you'll find the variation in the dem the demographics. So in this case we're looking at uh, excess weight for entry into school and then it's uh, 10 and 11 years old. We see our bars here. Okay, so uh, this place here has the highest in excess weight for for both uh, reception and year six. We're down here. We have the the least problems around here. Then we have the bunch in the middle. So we would worry about someone like this, which has uh, massively increased uh, the obesity between reception and year six, where someone like this is doing pretty well. And you can see that uh, the rates are about the same, 20.2 to 21.5. Okay, so it's important sometimes that we look at the norm, but what we look for is outliers. So anybody above the outlier here, any above the trend is actually not doing so well. Anyone below the trend is doing very well. Okay, so we can see in this case these places are showing very little increase in the uh, excess weight levels. And these ones here have generally low levels at, at both at at uh, for both uh, reception and year six. Then if we look at uh, smoking smoking demographics, we actually see quite a quite a, a change in the, uh, in the in the pattern. So in this case, we uh, if we look at smoking, then we're looking at the smoking death rates per one hundred thousand, and also quit rates. So we can see here that uh, Islington, Barking, and Tower Hamlets have the highest smoking death rates. But they also have a high uh, quit rate, which is probably a good sign that uh, people are, are quitting smoking. So the ones uh, above the trend are doing quite well in that they have a relatively high quit rate, possibly as opposed to the smoking rate. But the ones below uh, possibly aren't doing so well, so they have a relatively high smoking death rate and not a high quit rate. Okay, so this shows us our, our different trends that we have for smoking. Where we would be most worried is the ones that go above the, the general trend. And London itself does a loneliness uh, survey and what we'll see is that loneliness typically is, is a is a factor within inside more deprived areas. Okay, so in this case we're looking at the loneliness ranking. Number one is the most lonely place and this is the least lonely place. And then we'll plot it against uh, the percentage of low-income families. So we can actually see the more deprived the area, the more loneliness ranking that, they, that there actually is. And we can plot a formula towards that. So let's have a look at the detail of that to see where the most lonely place is. And it's Tower Hamlets 
and that's the most deprived there too, Hackney, Newham, Islington and so on. And then down here we have Richmond upon Thames and so on. So these tend to be the more affluent places, less lonely, less deprived. This is more lonely and more deprived. And if we want, we can actually plot. This is a secondary uh, uh, factor. We can actually plot the percentage of voted for Labour against loneliness, and we can actually see a correlation there. And it's really because the uh, the, the the more deprived area, the more likely they are to to vote for for Labour. And this here actually what we can do is we can actually plot a, a, th a third axis here in terms, we bring the two graphs together so this is taking loneliness, uh, low income families and then the percentage of voted labour so you can actually see very strong coloured red uh, gives us our our strong labour support and these are less likely to vote labour and then there's some in between this one has has labour support. Sorry, this one does not have labour support, uh, and is there. But uh, the highest here, this uh, but here, actually has a reasonably strong labour vote, and uh, for the uh, in relation to it's, it's uh, deprived. It's, it's relatively less deprived than the others. Okay, so let's have a look at that plot from there. Okay, so now let's look at uh, some homelessness. So with homelessness, homelessness, uh, we can actually plot the number of uh, of of homeless people, and we can look at uh, low income. Uh, families and generally it's an upward trend uh, the greater the number of home low income families the greater the number of homelessness there is in an area so with this plot we should be able to see that and we'll see uh, this is the least deprived areas relatively low homelessness and these are the more deprived areas and relatively high degrees of homelessness. This one here has considerably higher than the trend that we have here. Again, we often look for for those outliers. And for loneliness, we can actually see again for the loneliness factor, we're more likely to get higher levels of of homelessness against the places who who uh, have a less lo loneliness ranking. Then we see some outliers. In this case, we look at homelessness uh, and bed and breakfast and hopelessness against hotels. And they generally fit in, into that sort of region there. But as you see in Hackney, Hackney buck the trend and have many more hostels than bed and breakfasts. Then we can look at uh, the private sector accommodation. And again, we see a couple of outliers here. And the outliers, the outliers are here, and here, and they have much more local authority stock, where the other boroughs are generally using uh, much more private sector uh, accommodation. Okay, but these these two stick out as as an anomaly compared to to the other ones. We can also look th at this in terms of a, a bubble plot. It gives us a bit more uh, information. We can plot three things on our our chart. In this case, it's the is homelessness, uh, and we can see that these are the areas here that have the most needs for homelessness in terms of Asian or Asian British families. Then we'll look at uh, ethnic uh, unemployment. Uh, we actually see that uh, there are certain places which 
which seem to to buck the trend in terms of uh, uh, ethnic employment. So this is uh, white employment rate, and then this is uh, employment rates of ethnic minorities. So most places have have a good split between the two, but in some areas, then this is not the case. So if we actually look at that trace. We see here these ones seem to buck the trend. We go from 73 to 46.6, when in here we almost ha we actually have an increase, 81 to 82, in terms of white employment against ethnic minority employment. Okay, so this area here obviously has some problem uh, where we have a, a, a massive difference between employment levels. Okay, so you can look at other ones and see the different trends. Okay, so that's been a quick analysis of health and social care.